So welcome to the show, everybody. <laughs> this is Christ in Capital. Uh, intro, intro, intro. Uh, okay. So Nathan, what are we talking about today? We are talking about different ideas on essential work and whether or not this whole like 40 hour work week is just a made up thing by capitalism to suck your joy, whether there are different ways that we can approach uh, work, whether or not um, we should have a system that emphasizes leisure more, whether or not life, work is life sucking, whether or not in the words of one of the authors we're gonna talk about, we need a whole revolution, um, a socialist feminist revolution. Socialist feminist, yep. Yes. Yeah, I, you sent me these articles and uh, you know, the first article you sent me was from a, a website or a, a journal or whatever called Jezebel. And I was like, hmm, pretty, pretty fitting. Um, <laughs> but, but I think let, let's start, start off by um, talking about the second one, the Vice article, because that was kind of the starting point for the author of the um, Jezebel piece because she quoted a piece in there or she quoted a, an interview that was done, um, that was given to, do you give an interview to someone? Yeah, give, or interview that was uh, with taken with, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, Nancy Frazier, who is a self-described uh, socialist, feminist, thought leader, speaker, whatever. Um, and uh, before I dive into some of her quotes, I just want to get your thoughts, Nathan. Nathan, what is a essential worker? Or, or like whenever we started this whole lockdown stuff mm -hmm. and they said, hey, let's, uh, let's cut back and only people who are essential workers go to work. What, at that time, what, what is an essential worker? What did you think an essential worker was or what was essential work? Yeah, well, that's, I think that is one of the kind of linchpin conversations that our society never had, but probably needed to, um, because you had just the government kind of deciding ad hoc what was essential. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of, they reduced essential work to what are the things that um, produce commodities that keep people alive. And so they were like, well, food, right? So, you know, truckers and food, you know, uh, meat packers and uh, grocery store employees and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then healthcare, right? So of course. Yeah. Um, and, and I think education, they kind of threw that in there. Like they tried to keep the schools open at least on, you know, Google Hangouts or Zoom, like they tried to at least keep the school going for a bit. Um, yeah. They kind of reduced, so essential meant, what are the things that are being produced that are kind of baseline necessary for survival? Yeah. But I think a lot of people rightly argued that all work is essential work to the people who are doing the work. Right. Because right. you can't survive unless you get paid money that you then spend on the things that you need in order to survive. So you had right, right. millions of people out of work because the government deemed, you know, hardware stores non-essential or they deemed, you know, restaurants non-essential or whatever. They just decided things were non-essential. And now you have all these people who, for them, the work was quite essential to survive. We're out of work. Right, right. And that opened up the larger conversation about if some kinds of work are non-essential, why are people doing them? Yeah, exactly. And and the the authors of I think both of these pieces, well, no, I think that was the quote that was carried forward um, from the one article to the other was, if you know if we're deeming something essential or non-essential, why are we doing it at all? And I I, I get it a little bit. Um, if they aren't essential, sure, why not? Why, why, why are they doing it? But we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. But um, I found this little piece, I think it was on, or not a piece, it was um, just a little list of what, maybe it's the CDC or this one's from epi.org. What is EPI? I don't know where I got this. Um, 
essential workers by industry. And some of the things are like food and agriculture, emergency services, transportation, warehouse and delivery, industrial, commercial, residential facilities, healthcare, government and community-based services, debatable, communications and IT, financial sector. One down here says critical manufacturing, which that's kind of subjective. Yeah. What's critical manufacturing? What's I think they're leaving, they're leaving it a uh, soft definition so that <laughs> you just make it whatever you want. But, but I, get, I think that's my point. Um, who is deciding what's essential? Who made this list? Um, because what's essential for someone in a government office somewhere, I mean, I don't know. I just, I can see some, some issues there. Some, some, um, I don't know, priorities, out of line priorities, deciding what is essential and what isn't. Um, well, this kind of goes back to the last podcast that you and I had um, talking about when Thomas Sowell was talking about the problems with central planning, being that nobody, no one individual can actually understand all the little um, networks, essential networks that are created in the vast economy. And so you can't actually plan for what's essential, what's not, what can we cut, what can we keep? Right. Uh, one person doesn't have the ability to know all the intricacies and nuances of that. Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of that we talked about how they would, central planners decide what is to be produced or what can be produced or should be produced. But it's like we're doing the opposite in, with this one. We're saying what shouldn't be produced or what, we can do away with. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, let me, let me read a few of these quotes real quick so you can get an idea of what Nancy Frazier was all about. Um, and yeah, let me, let me just start. So the first quote she says, um, she calls it care work. That's what her, her phrase was care work. Um, care work, which Fraser defined more broadly as, quote, social reproduction, included everything from raising children and caring for friends and family to maintaining the social bonds that bring communi communities together. Fraser contended that our capitalist system devalued this type of work, despite the fact that we all depend on such care every day, paying very little for it or taking it for granted and subsequently making it more and more difficult to do. Uh, she also says capital, which is a huge uh, center of power in our society is kind of primed in its DNA to try to avoid paying for that absolutely necessary care work. Um, and then the last quote is kind of long, which she says, capitalism recruits women into the workforce while the financial sector puts enormous pressures on governments to cut social spending. So now we have women being expected to, to devote many more hours to waged labor while the government is providing less and less of social provision that would conceivably take up some of the slack. Then you add in real wages being driven downwards despite the hu huge rises in profits, debatable, which means every household requires more and more hours of waged labor in order to just end up with the same amount of income to support the household. This is a kind of time crunch, if you see what I mean. It's going to provide unwaged care work, or is, she says, who's going to provide unwaged care work under these conditions? We've been seeing this long before coronavirus came, this huge squeeze on the whole social reproductive sector. So when I was reading this, Nathan, and you, I don't know if you got the same sense, uh, she's making a strong case for the return of the, the housewife. I mean, I mean, she, she, she did. She's basically saying no one's doing the work that type of work anymore and her solution is is i think it's is silly she says those work those should be paid those should be paid and i'm not saying that that's not that's silly that's silly that that um that type of work should be paid i'm just saying who's going to decide what what type of work is necessary or is required or is valued she's saying that um she's making this this claim that um uh, she quote, she says, there is this huge problem of an unpaid bill for social reproduction or care work. And, and her, her solution is, you know, we need to have some sort of government intervention to come in and, and do something about this. But 
if you if you put it in the hands of a government or some type type of agency to decide what types of care work are valued by society, it goes back to the discussion we had last last time. Who decides what's valued? How do we decide who who needs what? Um, who gets to decide what sort of resources are required? And I think she she basically, you know, instead of aiming at the target, she shot in the completely wrong direction. She she demonized capitalism when capitalism gives the individual and, and the family the power to decide what care work is valued. Mm -hmm. um, whereas what she's saying is give it to the, the government or some sort of planning agency to decide what's valued for society and then administer appropriately. No, <laughs> uh, just blatantly, no, that's not, that is not uh, a good way to go about doing things. It's not efficient. It's not effective. We've seen it all throughout history. So yeah, that, this is my rant. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're dead on. I read, so in that article, that interview that you were quoting from, it gave a link to a journal article that she had written that um, kind of went a little bit deeper into her thoughts. And yeah, she made an interesting historical point, which is that um, we find a contradiction in kind of neoliberal capitalism, that's what she calls it, neoliberal capitalism, where neoliberal capitalism says everyone needs to work. And the kind of the fundamental goal of being a human is to produce and consume, that's her claim. Okay. Um, which drives women into the workforce. But then the other kind of contradictory side is in order for the capitalist system to continue, you need there to be children and you need people to be taken care of and you need, you know, that whole kind of uh, yeah. social reproduction. And she's like, but you can't do that. You can't do all the social reproduction stuff if you're busy, you know, doing this, this grind. Uh, yeah, and hustle, work. yeah. So to yeah. your point, if, if you just read that, you might think, oh, well, maybe she's saying that we should spend less energy, you know, telling women that their value comes from their work and create a social situation where if women want to, you know, stay home and be a mom that they don't have to feel ashamed about that. Because, you know, yeah. you know, plenty of moms who feel the pressure of having to work in order to find social value and stuff. Right. But instead she goes in the opposite direction. And she says, well, what we need is one of two things, either the government to provide um, free child care, free health care, um, the government to kind of take that care role so that women can work, or uh, the government needs to be paying, essentially like paying people who take care of their own kids. Yeah, yeah. When I was reading it, I had this image in my head of like the guy, like a guy coming home from work, and the the wife is um, in in the kitchen cooking or something and taking care of the kids, and he comes in and she's like, and he's and uh, he um, basically comes in, he's like, all right, how much do I owe you <laughs> for your services? <laughs> like, giving her some money. I'm like, that, I mean, that's the that's the thing that I got from this. Like, she wants all of this what she what she calls care work and i'm trying not to be like insensitive like yeah i mean i understand this is a touchy subject there's a lot of women who get really you know you know up, um up in arms about this just especially in pop culture um you know anyways that side note um but that that just seems kind of silly doesn't it? it i mean i i don't know i i don't i don't think that um, the, the government coming in, I, I don't think the government coming into the, our households and saying what types of work, like raising kids or, um, caring for grandparents or whatever, how much that's valued and how much money that's worth. That seems, that seems really, if I might sit, use the term dystopian. I don't yeah. Know. Well, we, I think we, we talked about this, um, well, quite a few weeks ago, I can't even remember which which episode it was. Um, we, well, we were talking about how often the most kind of um, important, personally important jobs uh, get paid very little, right? So, like you kind of 
if, if you want to reduce um, jobs to like, what's the most meaningful, um, you know, being a teacher or being a nurse or um, just taking care of your own kids, it's not really, you know, th those are very meaningful, but often they don't get paid very much or they don't get paid at all. Um, and that's fine. Actually, I mean, I think kind of the classical perspective on things is the more meaningful something is, the less money you get for it, you know, because it's supposed to be something that transcends kind of the seedy mammon sort of, um, yeah. you know, yeah. commodity sort of conversation. It, it, it's elevated to something that's beyond um, just earning. Yeah. But in our society, which I think is fundamentally Marxist in the way that it views um, meaning and value, everything gets reduced to commodity and uh, kind of what it's worth in a financial sense. So yeah. there's this kind of tacit assumption that, well, if it's important and meaningful, then you, it, it's worth a certain amount of money. Yeah. And that's just fundamentally not the way reality works. Right. Um, being a mom or a father, a husband, a wife, uh, that's more meaningful than me being a professor or, mm -hmm. you know, but I, that doesn't mean I should get paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I see what you're saying. Like there's this, um, I, haven't, I haven't really thought about this before, but um, there's a sense in which the economic transactions determine the value in an economic sense in, in the marketplace, but that's not the only way we value things. Um, you know, we, we value things from like what you're saying, a transcendental or a, um, yeah, a spiritual kind of, is kind of a weird word to describe it, but, um, but yeah, that, that kind of way. And, and, and a lot of times they don't, they don't translate because in the marketplace, if you think about it, the way we determine what's valued in a society is how much people are willing to pay for it. That's how we decide, you know, mm -hmm. what's being valued and what demand is for a product or a service. Um, but the CEO that's working at, you know, CEO of Walmart has a ton, a ton of money, but he may be destitute in his spiritual life or his, you know, emotional life. You know what I'm saying? There, there's no, but there's, but there's no trans correspondence between his fulfillment of purpose and meaning in a, in a market sense. Right. Right. And, and so that's where we get kind of this discussion where we're trying to force those transcendentals down into the marketplace and we're saying you know teachers and and healthcare workers and all this all this stuff um do you not realize how much you uh they, they do for us they should be paid a, a billion dollars um and usually it comes along with the uh, football players make blah, 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 and teachers only make blah, 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 like you know what i'm saying um mm -hmm. and and there's just it's not yeah, that's, that's, I don't think that's a good analogy or a good way to think about those types of issues. Um, no. and maybe, it, maybe it says something about the supply and demand too. Like you're, you're talking about so people, people, sometimes people take jobs because of, um, you know, the transcendental aspect, you know, it, the purpose and the meaning behind it. And if you think about it, maybe, maybe that's something that, a ton of people see and there's a ton of people that want to take those sorts of jobs and when when you think about it in that way it's like okay well well it's increased supply of a certain job uh reduces the the the, the payment for it because there's a ton more people willing to do it i don't know i haven't i haven't thought through that um too much yet but yeah i i, I don't know well yeah i mean and and part of it is I like that we're making a distinction between market value and like personal value or spiritual value, transcendent value. Like those are different kinds of values. And so yeah. prices um, and you know salary, those speak to market value, but they don't speak at all to personal value or, or spiritual value or transcendental value at all. It's just market value. Um, and also you just kind of have to realize that things are incredibly complex. The only reason why LeBron James makes as much money as he does is because he makes his organization a bunch of money, right? Yeah. Like yeah. 
And odds are he makes his he makes his organization have more money than they're being paid. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been hired. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so um, when, you know, I don't get paid, I, I will work my whole life and not make as much as LeBron James makes in a month. Right. Is he, he makes like $40 million a year. So yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't know. You know, I'm not going to make that um, my whole life. But that's okay because I'm not making my college millions of dollars, right? I'm not bringing yeah. them in that revenue. So why would I expect them to, to pay me for what I'm not bringing them in? Um, right. you, can, you can track this out in a number of professions. So for example, yes, it would be nice if we paid um, nurses more money. They're very yeah. important. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at the medical medical profession as it is, nurses don't get paid as much as PAs. PAs don't get paid as much as doctors. Right. You know, it's like full full doctors. But of course, the investment, the money investment, the time investment is also um, proportional to what they get paid. So if you're a doctor, you're not going to want to go through five years of medical school and, you know, five years of residency. You're not going to want to go right. through all that and go into all that debt and do all that stuff. If you're going to get paid the same amount that you would get paid if you went to two years of nursing school. Right. Right. So it's too simplistic to just say, um, Oh, well, we need to pay the people who do really important work for society, you know, more than the people who don't do important work. Like. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I think that's one of the things that's missing in, uh, discussions about, about this, you know, um, we have a, we have a Instagram account for Creston Capital and you go through some of the hashtags, like you can search hashtags and look through all the different posts that people post to that. And it's, it's interesting how the hashtag capitalism has more, uh, haters of capitalism that post to it than, it, than it than the other side so it, and i'm looking through those a lot and it's just it boggles me how people how misunderstood the whole economic system of capitalism is and and i think the general consensus is you know it's unfair you know look how it's failed us especially in this time of coronavirus look at how it's failed and and all this stuff um but if we boil it down to its basic, basic, basic idea, capitalism is just ownership. You own your means of production and your most basic means of production are your, your body, the thing that God gave you, and your time or your labor or the things that you do with your body and your time. That's it. That's the basic thing. Everyone that's ever done anything, if we're, if we're looking at, um, if we're using a free market uh, framework, the only thing that people have ever um, used to build to their wealth is those things. They've all started out with the same thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some people probably may have gotten an inheritance from their parents, but their parents did that. They, they started out with their own body and time. They built their wealth and they were able to give it to their children. But the idea is that you own the things that you, you build for. You, you, you build up and you save up and you, um, you use your time wisely, you use your, your skills wisely. Um, yeah, so, so it's ownership. And when you, when you wrap your arms around that, then you ask the question, uh, can I trade this for something else? Can I, um, wh what will someone else give me for some of this stuff, for some of the stuff that I've generated? Um, but I think what, what the general mindset that's going on in, in these hashtag arguments is it's unfair that someone has this certain amount. It's like, we're, we're, I, I thought about it like this. The, the people who are arguing for a socialistic, um, you know, central, centrally planned government kind of thing, kind of e economic system are arguing outcomes. They're, mm. argue, they're arguing for the unfair outcome of wealth distribution, whatever. And the people who are arguing for the capitalist side are arguing for the mechanism by which we determine who gets what. So it's like we're talking at two different levels. One's arguing the outcomes, 
um, it looks unfair, disparate treatment, disparate, you know, perceived, um, you know, inequalities. And then the capitalist is saying, okay, well, how do we determine what, what, what's the argument there? How do we determine who gets what? Oops. How do we determine what's distributed? What's, what does distributed mean? How do we, who's distributing what? That's the question that we're arguing. And so there's this like disconnect there, I think. Um, yeah. And it just, it, it frustrates me because we're talking, it's almost like we're talking apples and oranges. Um, and I don't know, I, I, yeah. capitalism I think is the, is the best way to go, but. I like how you kind of framed capitalism at its basic roots, you know, like this is what mere capitalism is. Um, it's mere capitalism. Mere cap yeah. You could write a book, mere capitalism. I mean, yeah, hey, why not? Um, yep, right on uh, C.S. Lewis's coattails. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that capitalism, where you go, where we go wrong is one of two directions. Either looking at capitalism and going, okay, here are, all, here are a lot of problems in society. It's the system's fault. It's capitalism's fault. So we need a new system. Uh, and usually it means more, more tampering, more involvement kind of more complexity, right? Which yep. unfortunately, greater complexity just creates the possibility for more problems, right? Like um, we see, you know, Soviet Union is great, that, that great example. The other problem, the other side would be if you expect capitalism to do too much, right? If you think capitalism is going to fix everything, you know, it's gonna right. fix all these social problems. And it's like, no, capitalism can create the context by which things can be fixed, but people still need to make choices. Yeah. People still need to have character. People still mm -hmm. need to be wise. Um, you still need a government to protect people so they're not getting murdered or stolen from all the time, you know, right? And so you do have kind of, there are some people who think, well, if the government just can protect the capitalist system all the problems will be fixed. And as Christians, we know, well, no, because market solutions uh, can only go so far, right? Yeah. There are spiritual problems, there are personal problems, there are lots of things. But we also wouldn't want to go to the other side and say, well, then all of those problems we see in society are capitalist problems and we need a new system. It's like, that's the, that's the Marxist yeah. stamp right there, yeah. um, is reducing everything to kind of what's the, what's the economic um, system that's gonna fix all of our problems. Yeah. Um, so w when you're saying the capitalism, the capitalist economic system uh, provides the, I don't know if the, the term you use was foundation or- Or context. Yeah. That was the term you used. It, it provides that, the context for which we can actually address these social issues. So let's explore the other side. Let's just talk about that real quick. So if we take a centrally planned, are we saying that eliminates our opportunities or it kind of like binds us from addressing those issues within, you know, on a more local context, like individually, family, um, community? Um, I've never really thought about that before, but it seems to make sense to me. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good way to put it we most of the fundamental problems of human society are personal problems first and foremost right my own sin nature yep. and then those problems are kind of expressed outward in um concentric circles from the smallest to the biggest right my personal problems extend to my family and our problems which extend to my local community and our problems and then extend outward from there. Yeah. Um, what capitalism does is creates a context where I have enough freedom to start with me and then work out and to kind of start working on some of those, those problems, those issues. But yeah. a top-down um, kind of control, command economy sort of system, it tries to deal with the big stuff. And by dealing with the big stuff, it's restricting your individual ability to make some yep. of those choices, right? Yeah. Um, so you've got to you've got to fix the big overarching, in biblical terms, the beast. You've got to tame the beast first, and then you can try to drill down into the community level. But I mean, I mean, if if that's the case, if you if you set up this system up top, 
then you're going to have rules down here at the bottom that restrict you from doing certain things. And, and ultimately, and if we're talking about self-government, family government, community, church government, state government, all that, if we're talking those different spheres, different realms, um, I mean, if, if you, if you assume that the over the state or the overarching, you know, governor is, um, totally sovereign and totally in control and then you set that in stone then that kind of keeps you from doing anything and and it causes even more problems when you realize that we're as human beings our issues like you were saying are internal they're they're individual first Mm -hmm. well if you don't change the heart if you don't change the disposition uh of the person towards his neighbor or towards his community or whatever and you set these rules down well you didn't really do much i mean it doesn't matter what you do. The person is still, you know, still wants to, you know, cheat his neighbor or, you know, all, all these different vices. Um, yeah. So an example that Thomas Sowell gives, I think, in discriminatory, discrimination and disparities um, is, okay, the government in the 60s, well, really, I guess, starting in the, the probably in the 40s, but they're looking at poverty, right? And, um and that's a big kind of overarching issue. Poverty, you look at statistics, you look at trends. And so then they start laying out welfare programs to address poverty. And one of the ways that they're trying to address poverty is by giving more money to single moms. And the more kids you have as a single mom, the more money you get from the government. And on a kind of a large scale, it seems to work, right? Or it seems to make sense. Okay, you've got all these single moms, they need help the more money we give them, now they can get out of poverty and help their kids, right? But what, what Seoul shows is that all that did, or primarily what that did, is on the individual level, it incentivized um, men to sleep with these women and then leave them because they didn't feel any responsibility. And it incentivized these women to have more and more kids because that meant they would get more and more money from the government. And there would be no social consequences to these destructive lifestyles, the same lifestyles that are actually perpetuating poverty, right? Because there, I mean, it, it's proven at this point that one of the primary things that perpetuates poverty is broken families. And that's a generational thing. Yeah. And the government obviously wasn't trying to perpetuate- It was trying to be, to be merciful, right? right? I think there's a proverb that says, uh, the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Um, yeah, just mm. throw that in there. Anyways, <laughs> keep going. That's right. Yeah, no, exactly. So the, the attempt to kind of top down deal with big issues first, when you zero down on the individual level, what it does is it either in, it influences or restricts. In this example, it influences people to make bad choices because it's incentivizing those choices that perpetuates yeah. the problem. Yeah. In other situations, we can see where it actually restricts people's individual choice to keep them from doing things that might actually end up being good for them or their families or their communities, et cetera. So, and that's what capitalism can offer is it can offer freedom of choice. And, um, but you still, I, like you, I mean, you talk about all the time, like you, you still have to make choices and you still have to um, take responsibility for your own actions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've had discussions about um, that type of issue in the past with friends about um, you know government setting up incentives, even though it's kind of it's it's trying to be merciful, trying to be helpful, but it ultimately leads to um, incentivizing behaviors that just spiral out of control, and so and you start pushing back against those things that immediately are like are are perceived as good things, like good policies and, and you get the heat <laughs> so i think that's what we want to do with this this podcast is like talk about those things and start thinking about economics more critically um yeah and hopefully we we can get more people on board with thinking about economics in the long term more meaningful thoughtful discussions rather than just i saw this meme one time that sounded pretty cool um i'm gonna go with that that argument i yeah so one last thing before we move on to kind of tie it back to what we're talking about essential workers. 
Um, this is where incentivizing becomes interesting because I'm not sure how this would work, but what seems to make sense to me is that if you, if the government mandated that teachers will say, and I'm a teacher and I taught in high school and it's very hard work and it's very important work. But if they said teachers need to be paid, you know, six figures, because that's a really important job. What you would get is a lot of people doing the job primarily for the money. And I don't think teaching is one of those professions that you want people in there doing it specifically for the money. Like you, the, the, the fact that teaching means you're putting in a ton of hours, um, you're working really hard and you're not getting paid very much. There's a weeding out process there to where ideally most, not all obviously, but a good bit of the people who are teaching are doing it because they actually love the kids because they're invested in what's important about education. They're not yeah. just for the financial benefit. Yeah, and so, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, and it's the same thing with, not, not completely, obviously there are exceptions, but it's the same thing with um, being a parent. If you I was, knew- Yeah, I was, right? gonna go, I was gonna go to like adoption services. Okay, that would be a good example, right? I mean. There's a lot of hoops you have to jump through to adopt and it's expensive. And if anybody could just adopt a kid or even get paid to adopt a kid, which is one of the reasons why there's so many problems in the foster system is because you actually get money from the government to foster. And everybody yeah. knows, yeah. And everybody knows the foster system is not working. There are so many abusive situations. So many people who should not be foster parents are foster parents because they get it from the government to do it. Adoption, on the other hand, you have to be the one to pay. Now, I it gets, it gets to the whole uh, skin in the game discussion. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with kids. If we, we do try to create some, um, to we try to ease the financial burden of having children by giving like tax breaks and tax incentives and stuff like that. And I think that's that's good. But imagine if the government said. Um, for every kid you have, we're going to give you an extra 10 grand. And we're also going to pay for his education, pay for childcare, um, pay for healthcare. So any of the checkups, any of the things. Basically, we're going to make it so that having a child is actually going to get you more money than if you didn't. Sign me up. Right, yeah. I think you would have more people having kids, which in one sense you can go, that's great, right? Children, life, that's good. But in another sense, you go, okay, but when, when people have to go through the thought process of, um, I know that having an extra child is gonna be a greater financial burden. Uh, it might mean I have to work less. Um, this is gonna be difficult. And you still make that choice to have that kid. You're vet, you have a vested interest now in, yeah. in your child. And this isn't to, to simplify things and saying that, you know, therefore all parents are great parents or saying that there aren't plenty of, plenty of problems, but it is to say, that often because there isn't a financial incentive to do really important, meaningful care work, that kind of weeds out some of the people who shouldn't be doing care work. You can send all your emails to nathan at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I, this, this, this type of thing, like I'm, like, a, like I said, uh, when you, when you don't, dig into the details you don't have when you're just in passing you're trying to give your elevator pitch for a certain policy and you don't have this discussion it this discussion does not get had or did not get had yeah it doesn't it doesn't happen um but but they need to um but they're just not and it, and i think the the easy like um you know easily comprehensible I keep using words that I think I'm just making up, but they make sense in my head. So the, the, the ideas that are easy to comprehend right off the bat are the ones that kind of drive cultural opinion, societal opinion, uh, public policy. And yeah, that I think this type of discussion is what, what needs to get had. Um, yeah, but it's not. Like I said, I've had that discussion about incentives and, and foregoing the immediate immediate uh immediately 
good, um, you know, merciful policy for something more ro more robust, you know, and you always get a get flack. But um, I, I know we're kind of running long, so instead of going to the next, diving into the next article in detail, is there anything specific you wanted to call out on that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you want to my big ahead. issue with the other article, which I guess you'll link in the show notes, um, is that the basically it was saying, okay, work is soul sucking. Why do we have to work so much? And why can't more people work fewer hours doing essential things that they love um, and then have a lot more leisure time? And that same argument was being paired with this idea of why don't we get rid of non-essential work? Why are people putting in 60 hours a week doing jobs that aren't important, essentially? My, and I, I was ambivalent about the article because in one sense, as a Christian, I acknowledge that work can be an idol and that work for work's sake is not a Christian ideal. Um, that we're supposed to work hard, heartily into the Lord. We're supposed to, um, you know, mind our business, work with our hands. We're supposed to create, but that doesn't mean that our identity should be our work. And it doesn't mean that work's the most important thing. Um, so I kind of was jiving with some of that, like, yeah, like there's an unhealthy sort of perspective in America on yeah. work, but then the conclusions were so off base and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got a beef with a lot of the conclusions, but one is just like a fundamental inconsistency about the article because they interviewed a bunch of people who were talking about how they want more leisure time. But the things that they were going to do on their leisure time required other people to be working jobs deemed non-essential. So, you know, yeah. I want more leisure time so that I can go play tennis. Okay, great. But you need people to build the tennis Create court. tennis courts. <laughs> yeah, keep up the tennis court, do all those sorts of things, make tennis balls, make tennis rackets. All those things are non-essential, you know, in one sense. But if you want to go do that in your leisure time, you got to have somebody doing it. I want to go to a restaurant eat food, drink cocktails. Okay, well then you're gonna need people who are busting their butt at 10 p.m. working at that restaurant so you can have your leisure time. So all these people who say, I wanna work less so I can leisure. Well then the only way you can leisure is if other people are working during their leisure time, specifically doing things that aren't categorized as essential because that's what leisure means, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that was a big beef it kind of exposes what you've just been saying about no one having the conversations about how all these things are supposed to work out. Like, yes, it would be great. Work 20 hours a week and then have fun. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> right. But how, what, how are you going to be able to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and doing that? I think one of the last little pieces in that article, the lady said, um, my ideal job is no job. I want to work for a certain amount of years and, um, I think she said, build up my business and then sell it and then do nothing. <laughs> and I was like, okay, whatever. You, yeah, you can do that if you're successful, whatever. Um, but I was like, that, that seems like a fundamentally wrongheaded way of thinking about how, how an economy works. Uh, I mean, like you're saying, some, the tennis court people are going to have to be working when you're not working anymore. If you want to, if you're going to, do anything, <laughs> anything leisurely. Um, let me just, I want to quote this quote I, I pulled out of that article real quick. Um, she was talking about hustle culture. Uh, hus hustle culture reinforces myths of meritocracy. Myths of meritocracy. Mm. It's a myth. <laughs> Anyways, uh, hustle culture reinforces myths of meritocracy by encouraging people to work longer and harder, believing that our hard work will eventually be rewarded. Okay. Okay. If you, that I, I stopped in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the quote, because I just have to say something. If you get rid of that, if you get rid of the idea that if you work harder, you will, you know, get more, or you, you know, the incentive to actually work harder, you're, no one's going to work. Why would you work? Right. I mean, why, why would you work at all? If, well, 
yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand i don't understand her her thought here i think no i think you're absolutely right unions are a great example of this um is that there are plenty of union uh workers who they cannot get fired they can't get fired and so they don't work um now that's not as much of a reality down south because most <laughs> there aren't that many unions down here because a lot of the governments don't like the unions for that very reason um but there are i mean you just hear story after story of um this goes back to the teacher thing uh, teachers unions in certain big cities actually incentivize uh, teachers to not work um, and not spend time there yeah. because yeah. they can't be fired. And so I think to your point, um, if we had a whole society that was like that, where uh, you getting a paycheck was not contingent upon your work or your work ethic or what you produced, one, the, I don't see how that could actually work, like how that could yeah. happen in reality. But two, it, we'd be incentivizing all the wrong things. And there's yeah. a great example of why the meritocracy isn't a myth. Obviously, you can find examples of people who work really hard and just look around. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so just so walk out your door and just kind of take a take a look. Put your head on a swivel. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. Um, but my wife. Uh, has only been working a few months at this chiropractic clinic. And in that time, um, she's shown up to work on time and she's worked hard and she's been a pleasant person to be around in the office. And so at the same time that she's been doing that, one of the people doing the same job she's doing got fired because she was a poisonous personality in the office and just a just a really bad person. And then another person almost got fired because he kept showing up late. And he would have gotten fired if the other person hadn't just gotten fired and they needed to keep somebody. Up, right? At yeah. the same time, they went to my wife and said, hey, even though our policy is you don't get holiday pay until you work a year, we're going to give you holiday pay over Christmas because you've been doing such a great job. Yep. And their thought process is very simple. I'm an owner of a small business. I need workers who are invested in this, who are gonna show up on time, who are gonna do their job right, and who are gonna be good to work with. This person is doing all those things. These people aren't doing those things. So I'm gonna either fire these people or keep them where they are, but I'm gonna encourage this person yeah. and pay them, give them bonuses, do what I can to keep them because they're good for my business, right? You mean, you mean business owners aren't just exploiters? <gasps> <laughs> yeah that, yeah that's good um yeah and, and the the whole the, that theme of this and people don't say it in these terms but the meritocracy the myth of meritocracy um that's a big theme with people our age or you know people in our generation and i'm like what do you expect is going to replace it i mean if the I think about it like this. You can you can set up a, a socialistic system or a unionized system or something where everyone's getting equal amount, right? And you could tell yourself, you could be so passionate and so fervent about, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do it because I I I, I love it or or whatever. You know, I, I'm gonna go up because I think that's the right thing to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna work harder and, and do whatever because it's the right thing to do, even though I'm not getting paid more than the guy who's over here who's not doing anything. But over time, as the as it kind of settles and you the default position is always going to be downward because the the natural inclination is not is not to draw up. It's to relax. Mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? If, if you take your mind off of it, if you take your mind off of your passion to, you know, do better or whatever, the default position is just down. It's, right. it's, it's relaxed. It's, it's deflate. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's what the, the capitalist system does. It says, okay, if you're, if you want more, if you want to build more, reach for it, <laughs> like actually, actually strive and reach for it. Um, so, let, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, real quick to that. I think kind of the conservative approached would be that success isn't guaranteed by hard work 
And success isn't only contingent on hard work, but hard work plus community plus character more times than not leads to success. Yeah. And so for me, I've worked really hard. I've, you know, gotten a lot of education. I've tried to do the best I can at my jobs. But I also recognized that there were plenty of people around me at my church, the people I was working with, people who hired me, they invested in me, they supported me, they encouraged me. I had plenty of people who taught me, the, you know, gave me examples of how to be. Um, God obviously provided me opportunities uh, that mm -hmm. I took, you know. So this isn't to say only hard work and exclusively hard work and success is completely contingent upon somebody's effort. But it is to say that character, community, and hard work together lead to success far more times than not. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how teachers, you know, your, you know, professors and teachers, I don't know how like salary increases work, but you could, you could, I hear someone, I hear someone, the opposer saying, uh, yeah, but I can work harder and I'm not going to get paid more because my salary is dependent on whatever, you know, whatever metric. But I mean, you're a perfect example. It's your Saturday and you're coming on a podcast to talk about philosophy and theology and all that stuff. And we have a Patreon account. And so people can come and actually pay Patreon uh, in, through a Patreon account. And then you can get paid because you're working, right? You're, you're working more. It's yeah. not just tied to your job. It's tied, you know, you're making, making income, you know, hopefully everyone go and uh, I don't know, log, sign up for Patreon. Yeah. Sign up for Patreon. We can pay Nathan. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so let me, let me just jump to the last part of this quote. It says um, the myth of meritocracy, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's an ethos designed by companies and from which companies primarily benefit. Adopting this attitude toward work doesn't benefit us so much as it benefits employers who reap the lion's share of profits workers generate for them. E, um, do you know what the labor theory of value is? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the argument. That's, that's right all, out of the that's all it is. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, well, and, and for oh, go ahead. No, no. Keep, the, the just for everyone, the labor theory of value. This was, I think, Marx Marx's thing. Um, basically, if if a company um, is paying you less than their you're making for that company, um, they're being exploitive. Exploitative. <laughs> what? Exploitative. I'm terrible with words. Exploitative. <laughs> Exploit. Exploitative. exploitative, yeah. Exploitative, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the idea is that if you're not getting paid the amount that you're making for the company, then they're exploiting you, which is not, it's not true. It's, it's not as simple as that. <clears throat> so, Well, yeah, for two reasons. One, it's very hard to actually determine how much money each employee generating for the company right and there's a lot of redundancy you kind of have as the bigger a company gets the more redundancy there is and all that sort of stuff but also um it's just the reality that yeah i mean the ceo is going to be getting a lot more than you know the data entry guy and the data entry guys are important to the company but the fact is that the company the bigger the company gets the more jobs it's providing for these sorts of people so I mean, sure, they're getting, the higher ups are getting paid more, but also the higher ups are the ones who are giving you the job. <laughs> yep. They're also taking on more risk, more responsibility. Yeah. They're the ones that are um, risking harsher punishments if they fail. So, man. Okay. So any last thoughts, Nathan, before we sign off? So I think kind of a Christian response to all of this is um, we need to resist trying to find our complete identity in our work. And we need to resist the temptation to reduce meaning and value to money. Money is a gift from God. It's also a corrupting influence when we reduce our lives to money. Um, and I think we need to also cultivate and stoke contentment. Right. I mean, I think a lot of this, 
uh, kind of attitude that we're seeing about um, well, the things that we've been talking about in those articles is rooted in discontent and envy and frustration yeah. with how things are. And this would be the this would be the appropriate place to use the Philippians four thirteen verse as opposed to um, you know some type of physical activity where Christ can make me do anything that I believe, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> which is not what it was about. Um, it was about times like this, being content in everything, all circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Cultivating contentment and finding joy and meaning in your work that goes beyond your paycheck. I mean, I was talking to my wife the other day about this. My brother is moving to Nashville and he's a lawyer. So as a lawyer, obviously he's going to be paid a lot more than I am as a college professor. Um, but that's great and that's fine. I wouldn't want to be a lawyer. Like, I wouldn't enjoy that work. I thoroughly enjoy my work. And so to me, that's of greater value than how much I'm getting paid. And why would I envy a lawyer who gets paid more than me when I wouldn't want to do that job? Right. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so instead to go, okay, yeah, I, I get paid a certain amount and it's enough to provide for my family. And also, I really enjoy my work, and also it's meaningful, and also I feel like I'm serving the kingdom, and you know, adding all those sort of yeah. things. I I think I'm rich. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, yeah, um, I actually have found that my work. Um, I mean, I like doing what I'm doing, but doing this little side project has actually really been um, a you know fun thing something I find meaning in. Um, so yeah, if, if, if you're in a job that you don't like, Hey, start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, like I said, everybody go. Um, oh, actually I forgot to tell you, Nathan, I actually recorded a, um, an, a outro that I can just paste to the end of the, of the podcast. Um, or the end of our recordings so that I don't have to like stumble through my words, trying to pitch all of those things at one time. So, um, I guess the recording ends in three, two, one. <laughs> okay. we're good. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really smart. Yeah. Let me see how to do it.